Bom, é, eu gostaria de, então de utilizar a palavra para apresentar o nosso primeiro, uh, o nosso primeiro palestrante. O nosso primeiro palestrante é o professor Dr. Ivan Nacional, da, da Universidade de Kansas, da Fortaleza Universidade de Kansas. E aqui cabe um, um breve comentário acerca da biografia do professor Dangenoff. Uh, nós tivemos a satisfação de trazer uh, importantes pessoas, no sentido de, de pessoas que contribuíram efetivamente para a melhoria do ensino de patologia e para o ensino médico, se a gente considerar de uma maneira ampla, e das carreiras de saúde. E uh, o professor Dangenoff é uma dessas pessoas que a gente tem a, a satisfação de ter aqui. Ele é, é membro, como eu comentei, da Universidade da Faculdade de Ensino Universidade de Kansas. Ele iniciou sua docência em 1973, foi previamente do corpo docente da Universidade de Connecticut, da Harriman University of Jefferson Medical College, na Filadélfia. E o professor Dajanov, dada a sua grande contribuição ao ensino médico e ao ensino de patologia, de patologia mais especificamente, é um dos, dos poucos que recebeu uma premiação importante na questão de educação e patologia, norte-americana, que é aquela concedida pelo Grupo de Pesquisa em Educação em, 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 em Patologia. Para os presentes terem é, uma ideia, esse, esse prêmio ele foi concedido no caso do professor Dandinov na sua terceira edição, colocando ele em, uh, ao lado de outros expoentes do ensino de patologia que nós conhecemos pelas obras que deixaram, né? o professor Stanley Hobbins e o, uh, o professor Emanuel Rubin. Né? Então, o uh, professor é, é, Ivan foi meritório dessa, dessa, dessa premiação que foi é, concedida em 2007. Um, tem mais de 300 trabalhos originais, mais de 30 é, livros publicados e é, inclusive contribuições em obras importantes, além das, das suas próprias obras, algumas das mais disponíveis aqui. Então, um, sem mais é, me estender, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Jean-Jean, for, for being here. It's a really a great pleasure and a uh, honor to have you here. And Really, it's a, a, the title of your, your presentation, Challenges for Pathology Education in the Next and the uh, 21st Century, is really what we are uh, thinking for this meeting, uh, for these two days, and I hope that everything, I, I, I know that everything uh, here will be of great value for you to discuss the next 50 years of education here and outside these walls. Thank you very much, Dr. Obrigado, that's how much I know Portuguese. <laughs> I, I know a couple of other words, but they are not to be pronounced in this society. Uh, uh, I just wanted to tell you how excited I am that I'm here. I, I have an old friend of mine, Marcelo Franco, and he started here in Botucatu, and he spoke about this wonderful city and said, this is place that you have to visit in Brazil, and uh, I never thought that I, in my life I visit, but yeah, in life, as long as you can breathe, never say never. And I am really deeply touched to be invited to this, and I am going to try to speak. Uh, I'm not sure that I can speak for an hour and a half, in the way as Dale has marked on the program, but whatever I speak, it's okay, right? The other thing that I regret is uh, when I give lectures to medical students, I like to tell jokes. And my experience with telling jokes to, to foreign audiences is that they usually flat, fat, fall flat, so I'm not going to tell jokes. I, I like to tell sexual jokes. Those are not good. So they all usually really, you know, you kind of start uh, thinking about my sexual orientation. So I don't want you to have any doubts about that. Um, <laughs> stop laughing. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk challenges in pathology and my first challenge is to talk one and a half hour. I cannot do that. And I don't have any real answers for challenges. So I think that the message of 
my lecture is that we have to confront challenges as we see them or as they confront us. Uh, I think that different times require different solutions, but the most dangerous thing, in my opinion, is not to take care of the challenges, to ignore them, or to try to apply old formulas to the new problems. Uh, this is how my university tries to solve problems. We build buildings. And uh, I have been in Kansas, University of Kansas for 18 years. I, I have survived 10 deans. In America, you know, the dean is not chosen for two years or four years as here. It is a professional administrator, and the faculty don't like him, they just get rid of him. So in these 19 years, 18 years, I have survived 10 deans, and I can assure you that each of these deans has left one building like this. So that is their contribution. Uh, my contributions to pathology is to write books. I'm not sure that this is the best contribution. And I can only assure you that if I were younger than I am now, I would not spend my life writing books. Uh, I have to answer a question that people ask me, how many books did you write in your life? And I don't keep track of them. I write them because I think it's important. So my answer to that is, uh, this is like asking me how many girls did I kiss in my life? If you count how many girls you have kissed, you are doing it for the wrong reason, okay? That's my philosophy. I don't count books. Should I count this book as mine? Or you see this is translation into Chinese. So obviously, I didn't contribute anything. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that I, I don't make money upon these books. Uh, I, for this book, the translation rights cost me, or I made, I made money which is equivalent to 183 American dollars. So this is not the motivation. Why do I do it? I do it because I think that I could improve the medical education. I have spent my life not teaching, but trying to improve medical education. And here it brings us to this book, and you can see this is my name here. And if you look at the bottom, you can see that there is Versal and Portugues, Nelson and Deo Oliveira, and this is Deo's contribution. Uh, obviously, he and I are on the same page, as they would say in America, we believe in the same thing. And I wrote this atlas, we found the publisher who was willing to finance and subsidize their Portuguese translation and they were translated it in a record time of a couple of months. Whether it's going to be used depends on the pathologist and his colleagues, but I think it will because it is a translation that reflects my attitude toward histopathology. Histopathology as such has a role in medical education, and I think it should not be forgotten. I have several credos. My first and most important credo in teaching is, I say, I do not teach, I help you learn. The students get really mad at me because I say, I'm not going to spoon feed you, I'm not going to write books that you don't read. I'm not going to do this. I expect you to study your adults. I expect you to do your best, and I'm going to do my best and try to help you learn. Uh, I use the Socratic method. My is 
technical term, and that means midwifery. This, this guy Socrates had a mother who was a midwife. She was delivering babies. And I always say that uh, I want you to have some knowledge, and I'm going to help you deliver it. And I say, once you realize that you have this knowledge and that you are pregnant with it, the delivery will be relatively easy. I also tell them that they have to teach everybody, teach your dog, teach your wife or husband, teach your children, whoever you can teach, very important. It's transmitting this Socratic method to other that makes people learn the most. Uh, I tell them also that you could give somebody a fish and Leo L.B. de Oliveira took us to a wonderful lunch, so he gave us the fish and fortunately we ate very good and we didn't do we didn't do it the, the Socratic way, we didn't prepare it, but I can assure you that if you accomplish the preparation of the meal, you will not only have the taste, but you will have the feeling that you have accomplished something and that you have learned something for your life. I, I'm not a very good cook, but I kind of am an apprentice cook, and with my wife I have learned quite a bit of cooking. Uh, I also tell the students that there is something very important, and that is the relationship that I have with them. And that brings us to the fourth point on my slide here. I think that students do not care how much you know until they find out how much you care. In other words, you could be the Nobel Prize winning pathologist if they think that you do not care you are doing this just because you are paid to do it or because you are forced to do it. They will really not appreciate it. And I think that it's very, very important. It's my um, credo that I have put into action every year. And I try to convince them that I really care. Uh, I do not do transform them into pathologists, but I think that their knowledge of pathology will make them a better doctor. Finally, my last part of my freedom, and I can assure you that every year I repeat this slide in front of me and say you cannot reach them all. I mean, it is impossible to reach all the medical students, and there will be always some that will reject whatever you have tried to do for them. Uh, I will never forget a medical student who came to my class because he had problems with the material. So he and I sat down and started talking. And then I tried to tell him, listen, you know, this, what we are doing, is like a game. And you have to participate. If there are certain rules, put your effort, try to score a goal or something like that. He was looking at me and said, you know what? I came here to learn medicine, not to play games. Not to play games. And I said to myself, gee, would I ever like to have this young man as my personal doctor? If he cannot understand that the whole life is a big game, then we are on a different planet. So you cannot reach them all, unfortunately. Uh, I have been teaching pathology for 40 years, 4 zero, and I can tell you that I have met three students that I could not make him to doctors, medical doctors. And so I'm pretty cocky. That means if you give me, a, I don't know, a teenager, 
in terms of any medicine, I, I feel confident that I can teach you enough medicine so that you can pass the boards of the examinations. But these three kids, they have something that I don't know how to explain to you. You could immediately feel that something is wrong. One of them, for example, he could memorize the whole textbook of problems, 1,800 pages. And if I would open, he would ask which page it is, and he would start to recite it. And then, so it was one of those technical defects. The second one was emotional perturbed. He was having deviation. So I, uh, unfortunately, met him the next time after my classroom and he was in psychiatric hospital and he recognized me and he played music for me on the radio. And he said, this is um, the, the, the recorder. And he says, this is my favorite melody of yours. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you. He said, that's not important that you don't recognize you. This melody has your lecture on inflammation coded into music. And I said, wow. So these are people that you cannot reach, but I think that most of the people do not have this type of problems, and I think that we can teach them enough pathology for becoming a good doctor. Uh, pathology has been a backbone of preclinical teaching for at least 150 years, so if not more. The prominence of pathology has been reduced, however, because there are fewer hours that are assigned to us, because uh, pathology still figures high. In America, all the medical students take a unified exam called United States Medical Licensing Examination. And if you look at the questions, you will see that 60 to 70 percent of questions refer to pathology. Not direct pathology, but they are somehow linked. So uh, I can tell you one story that is really incredible. I, I, I met a woman who is a dermatopathologist in Texas. She's in her late thirties, very attractive woman. And she came to United States as a pathologist from Romania. She didn't speak English. Her husband was an oil engineer and was transferred to Texas, and she was there with a small child. And one day she told her husband, I'm going to do take the USMLE one, that's the first part of this American licensing examination. And he said, Great, but you don't speak English. How are you going to take the exam? And she says, Yeah, but I know pathology. I'm a board certified Romanian pathologist. And lo and behold, not knowing to speak English. And all what she knew were the soap operas in the afternoon when she was taking care of the baby. She would watch the television and she knew the soap opera. But that was not enough to hold the conversation. She could not read newspapers, she could not read the book, but she knew pathology. Lo and behold, she passed the USMLE one without knowledge of English, with just knowledge of pathology. So I tell my students, listen, so if you just move to the United States from Brazil and you know enough pathology, I can guarantee you that you have 80% chance of passing the boards. Incredible, but true. Um, the pathology has been uh, given a relatively lower ranking in the United States because of the integration of medical teaching. 85% of US medical schools have integrated preclinical curriculum. Previously, we were teaching anatomy separately, physiology separately, microbiology, pathology. There were seven subjects that were taught in all the medical schools in the United States separately. 
and then reintegrating that and starting doing so-called organ-based integration. So today, in my medical school, we have 13 organ-based blocks, and that's what we teach. And pathology is just one of the boys in the course, mainly if we start in the morning, they start with the histology of the kidney, then they have physiology of the kidney, then the pathology, and it all occurs within the period of two or three days. So pathology has, I must admit, at least in our medical school, uh, we suffering, we suffering because we have gotten less hours. However, I can also tell you that the anatomy that we are teaching has become more pathology oriented. The physiology is more pathophysiology oriented. So even though the number of hours devoted to pure pathology have been reduced, pathology has infiltrated other basic science subjects, and I think that, that is good. So this new curriculum is something that looks kind of fancy, and in our place it took some time because we had a very good previous curriculum. Just to give you an example from the previous curriculum, which was all computer-based, we, we had all these boxes, we had objectives, we had keywords, we had chat, clinical conferences, students loved it. It was a major shock when we integrated. The students were scared. But today, six years after the beginning of this integration, the students are quite happy. So how do we do it? What we do is we have these modules, which last four to eight weeks. They are all interdisciplinary. Uh, normal and abnormal structure and function are taught uh, concomitantly or in a sequence. It is very active and we require collaborative learning. That means we use uh, new approaches, team-based learning, uh, problem-based learning, uh, active discussion groups and so on. It is heavily technology-based. The students use tablets, virtual microscopy, and most importantly, they are constantly being assessed. Uh, there is all this, what I just said. Then we have concept mapping, and we have so-called integration hours. Uh, we have concluded that the students get lost in details. And if you ask a student how to integrate it, they are still at the stage where the knowledge is so fragmentary that they have real trouble putting it all together. Um, we have these angel learning content delivery system which help us also with course management, content management. All of our students have e-portfolios. E-portfolios are like, uh, electronic uh, ways of following their uh, progress. And I think that it is also a very important way of motivating students to do something else besides just what is on the on your program. To give you an example, uh, we have very little use of microscopy. However, I make an announcement at the beginning of the first year that students who would like to spend time doing microscopy could come and join us in the pathology department on a, we have a microscope with 12 heads, and you can actively participate in studying these slides. And the first thing that they ask me is, is that going to be recorded anywhere? 
And of course, it's going to be because I, I have access to their e-portfolios, and I'm going to say uh, John so-and-so was there on the 12th of January and actively participated in the sign-out of liver biopsies. And that goes because uh, in America, you have to realize that the grades are only part of the record of the medical student taking the belt after graduation. Uh, there is also a, a verbal narrative evaluation of every and each student. And that is usually written by uh, a committee. So you take out, in this case, it's going to be this portfolio. And all what you see, for example, you have an excellent student, but A in this, A in this, so he's an A plus student. And then you start looking for words. What are you going to say about it? And you, you go to the clinical years that usually have narrative evaluations. But in principle, each of these committees that is writing the recommendation of this student, and this recommendation is going to determine his life and future. And if you cannot put together three or four sentences that will make this student stand out issue is stand out. Right? Stand out and attract the attention of the committees that are going to employ. You are at a loss. But this e portfolios, you can put all these human aspects of education. You know, I have had John he volunteered to do an autopsy with me, design the autopsy together and he did all the literature research to document the pathology finding. Uh, I can say that he is able to think inductively and deductively, and I think that he will do extremely well in his clinical year. So one of these comments is a godsend for each of these committees that we try to find something unique about this medical student. Uh, I am a great uh, believer in technology, and I'm going to show you that we are using audience response system, virtual microscopy, and we have in the courtesy of the medical school a very good computer testing center, which I think is essential. This is our uh, aperio. Uh, <laughs> most Medical students in my medical school uh, do not use the microscope except the 10% who attend my microscopy sessions. The, the slides are all virtual microscopy, and here you can see them. That they can access the slides on their laptops. Uh, the lectures are also recorded. Uh, so at noon, the lectures stop at 12.15. All the lectures from that morning are being podcast and released to the medical students. So the students can choose to sit to my lectures or they can listen to my voice. Some of them like to look at me, enjoy my jokes. Some of them think that my jokes are waste of time. Uh, I, I have to tell you, uh, my medical students uh, give us grades. And there, there is the official grading system and there is the unofficial grading system. And if you really want to know what they think of you, then you read their unofficial grading system. So, uh, because two-thirds, 65% of students do not come to lectures, but think it as podcasts. They want to have control of the time that they are going to spend in each and every lecture. So they have, in my school, they have devised a system, and 
they call it BS grading system. BS stands for poor and unpronounceable word. We don't know what it means. But in essence, means how much does the professor deviate from the topic that he's supposed to? How many minutes did he spend on telling jokes that have nothing to do with the material? How much time he's bragging about how great a surgeon he is, this type of stuff. And the medical students use this type of grading to evaluate the lectures that are podcast. Because when the professors tell, start telling jokes, unless you are a captive audience like you are now, they can fast forward. Right? So they are professors who are very uh, dry and give like a like a machine gun. So you cannot skip anything. So on that BS scale, they get a grade of five. One is if the professor spends one hour and you don't know what he was talking about. Okay. Anyhow, I, I was kind of shocked when I discovered that I have 2.5 on that scale. And so I, you know, I went into a spin and my wife had to prepare a double whiskey scotch when I came home because I was depressed. I thought how good a professor I was. And my wife told me, listen, again, one of your cradles, you cannot reach them all, go and ask. Do you want me to speak faster or you want me to speak slower? And then I looked into my own soul and I said, Am I going to reach all the students? No. Am I going to transmit the five most important aspects of my lecture in a machine gun which is against my personality? Or in a slow lecture as I'm talking to you now, trying to hope, emphasizing three times the important thing. So I kind of settled down for my grade, yes, grade of 2.5, but I think that I'm too old to change my style. We have a very good computer testing system. Uh, I, I was talking with my colleagues here in pathology, and I, I was told that you have uh, exams where you put 50 students in the room. We, we put 100 students into this room, and you can see each of them has a computer of them, and each computer is lowered, so you, it's impossible to see what's your next uh, neighbor looking at. Not only that, but the exam has 100 questions, and the computer scrambles the questions. So even if you had the chance of looking on the right or left side, you would not know because it's a different question that your classmate is looking at. So we have induced the cheating to meaning. Uh, we have uh, also noticed that the students are relatively cooperative. Namely, sometimes we do not have access to this big testing room and we have to have two groups, one from nine, 11 and then 11 to 1 and there was very little difference between split them into that means there was no communication between the first and the second group which I think is very good. We believe that student assessment is very important. Uh, I believe in numbers and I was just reading a very important part of the Bill Gates, Bill Gates, the multi-billionaire computer guru. He puts out a yearly report about his company. And in this report that was partially transcribed into the Wall Street Journal, Bill Gates says that 
the numbers and measurements are extremely important. And he starts saying that the industrial revolution started when we started measuring things and you could measure the pressure that is generated by the steam engine. And one millimeter here, one millimeter there, you could modulate that. I believe that those real science can be really published and matter unless it is expressed in measurable results that can be reproduced or not reproduced for that matter. I also believe that educational outcomes have to have a number attached to them. You have to measure. How do you know that you are to separately measure performance on pathology and anatomy? And for us, it's important to see whether one of the topics, one of the subjects is dominating and getting good grades versus something that is being suppressed. Uh, we are developing competencies, and competencies are extremely difficult to measure, especially on the internet. And then, of course, there are these e-portfolio. Here is just to show you how each student during the whole thing to do is an individual student that is the class. He has to know where to stand. Uh, I can only tell you that in our class, we try to choose the best candidate. But whatever you do, you are going to have a bell shaped curve. You can be sure that the students who are at the bottom are going to have problems. And you can easily spot them after one or two blocks of our teaching. The problem is to convince the medical student that he is below the acceptable level of education. Now, I, I, I have to tell you a, a story, and that will give you the message. Uh, I am in my scientific life interested in testes and testicular tumors, in fertility thermogenesis. And I was visiting Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and they read my curriculum vitae, and they said, you will really like this. We have probably the biggest collection of testicular biopsies in the world. I said, wow, why would you have the biggest collection of testicular biopsies? Anybody who knows about infertility knows that for infertility you need a couple, a man and a woman. Right? And they have to try by definition one year, and if they do not manage to make the baby in one year, then you go to the doctor and, and you have to examine the man and the woman. Right? And the chances are that in some places, the statistics show that 60% of the infertility is due to women, 40% is due to men, and so on. But a significant number of men are infertile, right? not in the Arab culture. Right? Women cannot become pregnant. You tell as a doctor, the male, that he doesn't produce, he has his own sperm doesn't produce any sperm. He says, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So you go and then tell him, we are going to do a testis biopsy, and this testis biopsy will hopefully convince you that you cannot produce sperm. Yeah? So they have the biggest number of men who do not believe that they have azoospermia and want to be confirmed. They have really no capacity of producing sperm. I compare these azoospermic men with medical students who are failing the course. You 
Jordan leaves itself, they can't leave themselves here. They don't believe that they are failing the course. Everything is against system, professors, you know, this. so you have to do the testicular biopsy and the medical. Uh, I have had positive results and negative positives. Uh, we send out the lectures ahead of time, and we have been advocating that medical students read the lectures before the lecture. The computers have made a big difference. More and more students really open the computer and read the lecture before you do it. The students' feedback and criticism are so incredible. Uh, we, we never had so many constructive, critical remarks as the, the introduction of the computer system. They feel less inhibited. As we encourage them not to use profanities, not to be uh, rude, but they really can contribute. I have learned a lot from the students' feedback. Uh, the students, on the other hand, also get quick feedback. That testing room that you saw, they get the results immediately as they close to the computer. They know whether they have passed or failed. Uh, they can review the exam. They cannot take it out from the room, but they can review it. And there is nothing like learning from your own mistakes. Uh, I can tell you that I took my first American licensing examination in 1965. There are five questions that I still remember from those days because I have spent so much time thinking about I don't know whether I guessed them or not, but I use the same questions in the exam that I still give to my medical students. I'm so emotionally attached to those. And I'm attached to my faith. So think, what stays longer in your mind? A success, quick, tuk, tuk, or, no. again, I could say something asexual to give them. Student satisfaction has increased enormously. Our students are happy students. Uh, I have taught at the University of Kansas for 17 years in Philadelphia, four years, and most of the pre-med medical students had more negative comments than positive comments. Now, for the last six years, we have more positive comments significantly, statistically more positive, uh, the morale of the class has increased. They have more confidence, they believe that the material is teachable, they can master it. Negatives, ha, negatives always. For example, there is less interpersonal interaction. Although my office is open door and they can walk in, they do not the attendance of lectures has reduced because of the podcasting. Students rely more on the web than on the textbooks. Now, for a textbook writer like me, this is a big shock, but unfortunately, uh, complex concepts are difficult to convey in a short period of time. And we, as a group, have decided that we are going to test our medical students only on the material that was covered in the lectures. So you know that you have to cover it if you think it's important. So it has forced us to restructure the lectures, but time and content are big restrictions. Uh, one thing that is, I think, extremely difficult under present conditions and that is teaching medical students medical thinking and reasoning. For thinking and reasoning, you cannot replace the one-to-one -one interaction of small teaching. Uh, this is a, a 
picture that I got from a Japanese friend of mine. And he told me this is one of the biggest advantages of the computer learning. And on the western coast of Japan, they use these birds called cormorants for fishing. And as you can see, this bird here has a has a ring here, so he follows the fish, but cannot get the fish into the stomach. The fish is attached to the rope, so the fisherman brings the bird to his boat, and then he pushes here, and the fish comes out. This is the typical medical education that I went through. The professor was giving the lecture, I swallowed it, and the professor <coughs> came out, right? I think that with modern technology, we can modify this cormorant fishing and eliminate it. So what did I do to adjust to the new curriculum? I say something's changed, some change on their own, some change by design of the course, and some by necessity. Some things need to change, but do not. Some things I would not change under any circumstances. And my first name is Ivan, so I have seven eyes. I am not going to change any of these. Make my lectures interesting, informative, inspiring, interactive. I want to involve the students identify problems, insist on solutions. What I did personally, I restructured my lectures. I had to make pathology more clinically relevant. It cannot stand out on its own. I had to integrate micro, macro, molecular, clinical. I put in big letters pathophysiology. We learn more and more pathophysiology. Teach concepts rather than this problem solving and medical thinking. If you ask me what is the main function of teaching pathology, if you wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I will answer. Problem solving and medical thinking. Who cares about lipofusin and hemocytorin? I don't. And then interact with the student as much as possible. Uh, I use this type of tricks, like audience response system. These are the clickers that all our medical students have built into their computers now. So how do we do it? For example, we have this is from Robbins, you have a normal lung, you have ABC. The question is which one of the following cells in the alveolar walls secretes a fraction? And the answer is obviously the C, which is the lymphocyte type 2. The students click, it takes 20, minute, 20 seconds for them to click. Very efficient. We have a little discussion after that, and that's it. Explain what it is. I, this is an excellent way for me to teach the histology. Here, here is the book of the Highly membrane disease from Robbins, and we have arrows indicating the highly membrane. And I think it's important for them to know that this is fibrin. And I show them that, and they have to reach that this fibrin. It's interesting, after my lecture, I never get 100%. Uh, for example, with this, I get between 75 and 85. And I assure you, I mean, these are students who are coming to the lecture, they are hard motivated students. It takes time to memorize and to understand. I also encourage them to draw. This is a student drawing. I give them the question on the right hand side. And then I, this is it. for those who are not pathologists, on the right hand side you can see a carcinoid tumor. And I said, who is a good artist in the class? 
and who is going to make a good gross picture of this carcinoma and one of the medical students gave me this. So I think that this is what I call interactive relationship with medical students. This is my own drawing and so I tried to tell them that you don't have to be an artist. I'm very far from artists, but I like to draw diseases, hyperplasia, complex hyperplasia, complex hyperplasia of the endometrium with endothelia. And once you have the ability to translate your thoughts into drawing, I think that you have fuller command of the material. Uh, I like pathogenesis. I like this type of, we use those very much in our team-based sessions where we have the diagrams of this type and try to explain what is the role of this and that cell in the development of the acute respiratory distress syndrome, for example. Uh, this is another thing that I encourage my medical students to do on their own, and I can assure you that they love to do it. For example, this is the example that I, I give the liver lecture on hepatocellular carcinoma, and I tell them if you follow the four arrows, you can see that it forms the hepatic mass, it invades the veins, local spread, destruction of liver cells, and then finally you put all this together when you come up, why does the situs develop, why is there hemorrhage, and so on. And once they have constructed one of these, I can just show you, for example, this is on diabetes. Incredible. They do it very efficiently. Just diabetes affects the small blood vessels, what happens? How do you get rectal dysfunction, congestive heart failure? How do you get kidney? All these medical students generated algorithm. There is another one on sickle cell. Uh, they actively participate, and I really do not insist on details. For me, this is as close to teaching medical thinking and reasoning as you can come. So e-teaching, how to evaluate the efficiency of e-teaching, how do you define the endpoints, uh, are the results long-term or short-term valid, uh, is this subjective or objective evaluation? And then finally there is this term that I saw some place that is very important in America, it's called perceptology, is the subject for study. If they perceive that this is based on time, there is no way that you are going to ever get them on your side. Uh, I just want to say that all, all these things are measured and we know that one thing is for sure, the students, Hate it, hate the exams, but also you cannot imagine a good curriculum without exams. Uh, I have underlined this because I really believe that examinations drive the curriculum. The examinations should teach, and they should provide feedback, and examinations can be self-defeating when they can. You know, somebody told me how the students hated an anatomy class. Because uh, you can kill the students' interest by insisting on trivia, that professor's fault. The questions can be psychometrically invalid. Uh, I have been in this business for years, and I can tell you that getting a medical degree doesn't mean that you are a certified medical educator and that you know and have the ability to produce good psychometrically valid questions. It takes time, 
in our place, the experts for writing questions come every year, and it is compulsory. All the professors have to attend a three-hour seminar on how to write questions, how to evaluate questions, what's a good question, what is a bad question. Uh, you, know, you would think if it is every year that most professors would be able to do it. Disappointingly, unfortunately not. I don't know whether it sleeps to these three hours or sabotage it or whatever. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of bad questions on the exams. There's students frequently think that if they memorize facts, they will pass the exams. There is no way that you can pass the National Board of Medical Examiners by just knowing the facts. You have to know the thing. The example of the Romanian woman who had experienced with pathology, who knew to think like a pathologist, and even if, though she didn't speak English, she could pass it. But somebody who knows less, like the guy who memorized problems, he cannot pass it. I, I am very much interested in formats, and uh, I can show you some of the results that we have obtained when I was at Jefferson. Uh, we have done a lot of studying students, and we discovered that we can really improve the performance of students on these exams. Uh, here you have two columns. Uh, if you look before 84 and after 84, the red line shows the four years that you were there. You can see that the Jefferson results have jumped from 486 here to 551. And the national have stayed approximately the same. And then, if you look at this, this is statistically significant. And I can give you one secret. What we did was we have concentrated on early identification of students who have problems. I told you, we can identify them within the first two to four weeks of your teaching. Those students deserve your attention. By doing that, we have improved them. Not only that, but by stimulating the students who were in the top of the class. Top of the class for them, the typical pathology course, or whatever they are learning, is a little bit on the boring side, it becomes easy to them. They have time because they go through the material very fast. So I think that what we did here is we found extra stimulation for these students. Uh, we think that external standards are important. Uh, there are several approaches. For example, in Germany, they have prescribed curriculum. Everybody has to know everything. Exactly, in Munich or Hamburg, it's the same curriculum. You have 30 minutes assigned to teaching acute inflammation and 15 minutes to chronic inflammation. In Hamburg, Freiburg, wherever. Uh, I don't think this would work in the United States. In the United States, we have 135 medical schools, probably 135 different curriculums. Uh, I kind of believe that Brazil is more like the United States than Germany and would work. You need a minimum competence standard examination. That's what the national boards are. Now, why do you have a driver's license test. You do not want to let people who do not know to drive on the street because they are going to kill someone. 
but the driver's license test that tell you whether somebody is a good driver or a bad driver. National boards have designed this test, but unfortunately, my clinical colleagues, they look at numbers, and they are fixated on numbers. Even though it is, in essence, a driver license test, the national boards are used in America for selecting students. How? I'll give you an example. Orthopedic surgery, highly, highly competitive. Dermatology, highly competitive. We have two residency positions in orthopedic surgery and two in dermatology. You know how many applicants we get for these two positions? In each, 500. 500 for two positions. So what, what my colleagues in orthopedic surgery told me, we don't have time. We have to operate. We don't have time to select. So we tell them, the first elimination is done by the lowest secretary in the department. She can draw a line under a magic number, which in college in, on the USMLE is 240. 240 is 95th percentile. Do you know what is the number for the mean? 200. 25. So you don't have to be a statistical genius or an Einstein to see the, the difference between 225 and 240 cannot be statistically significant. It's not. And the people who come from the national boards to teach us how to make questions, they repeat every year the same stuff. And my orthopedic surgeons go back give the same instruction to their secretary. Draw the line. So the medical students are not stupid. They talk. They know that they have to get 240. So for the exam, this national exam that is supposed to be a driver's license test, there is two months of hysteria. Unproductive. But in my friend from Portugal, they charge to they tried to introduce the national exam. Nature based of time, right? So, to design something that is meaningful and socially useful, it's very difficult. It takes more than a couple of decisions. Uh, I think that competitiveness is important. My good friend, former dean of Jefferson, written articles defending the grading system because it promotes competitiveness. I think it's good. Our medical students are highly competitive, but we have to channel their competitiveness into something that is going to be useful. Uh, I have two examples to show you how the exams, in my opinion, should be changed. This is a multiple choice exam. Most of the people here are medical doctors. 70 year old man has been evaluated for possible resection, abdominal aorta. What is the cause of this? The 70 year, what could it be? Either hypertension or atherosclerosis, right? You put the same question into an open, cover the answers, and ask, most aneurysm of the normal aorta represent a complication of only 70%. That is the real knowledge. If you use the previous exam question, 95% of medical students will answer atherosclerosis if it is pre-digested and offered to you. If you give an open, not going to be like that. Look, 80% think it's Markham. And I said, you think that the Markham person will really be the most common? So 
first one in 7,000 people. It's a severe disease, right? but you cannot convince them. Okay. So the exams have to distinguish, and uh, I think writing good exams is very important. It takes practice. Uh, I think that if you have any investments to make into medical education, the most important investment that you could is to learn how to write good questions and how to evaluate the exams. I, I have been trying to promote this type of exams, which are called open-ended exam questions. It's a computer-based exam, and you, you have questions which are clinical. You see that little box, you can type in the answer. You can give you a little bit of help, because I have 5,000 diagnoses on the right side. So why not use computers? I think there are so many computer savvy young men who could develop. I'm a great admirer of technology, but I'm unfortunately technologically challenged. So I need the help of young people who are going to And I believe that open-ended questions are the answer to many of the problems that we are facing with the these are more reliable, they are better able to distinguish the route to from marginal to. If you give the same exam in multiple choice form, the same exam in an open-ended, computer-based, where they do not have the cues, it is about 30% less the mean. 30%. So, we estimate that the guessing of the American medical students in the age of 15 to 25%. They, even if they don't know, they can guess. So I am advocating, and I think it's one of the challenges for the 21st century. I'm going to, I almost used my, and you know that I'm going to be able to talk so long, but I'm going to show you this book by Dr. Tal Ben Shahar. He's professor at Harvard. This is a book called Happy. Why would I show you that? This is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, I think that the, the introduction of the computers into medical education and introduction of integrated curriculum, I have become a happier person. And I, I feel that this title of this book is very important because a happier professor makes students happier. And I think happy students are going to be happy doctors and that's going to translate into happy patients. This book is book that somebody gave me after having read an article about Harvard, Harvard top rating school. Undergraduate Harvard, impossible to get in. They accept 1,500 students out of the pool of 30,000 applicants. They would not accept me anyhow. But the most Popular freshman course is taught by this Dr. Ben Shahar, and he teaches them how to become a happier person. So I thought if they are teaching medical students in the top rank, and not medical students, regular students in the top rank Harvard to become happier people. Why wouldn't I do that in Kansas? So I can tell you, I became a student of happiness. I, you know, I think I can improve your happiness. I can improve the happiness of my medical students. And I can quote my 
hope that it is going to be somehow transmitted, even though it is English dramatic. My favorite evaluation that I got from one of the medical students was funny, silly, old man. So this was the biggest compliment that I ever got for my teaching. Thank you for suffering through my pontification, and I hope that my message about happiness will stick with you. Bye-bye.
those students who attend the autopsy, they go to the Mobility and Mortality Conference, which is a clinical pathological correlation. And the, the propaganda that we get from those students, it, you cannot measure it in, in dollars. I mean, it's really good for pathology, it's good for autopsies, it's good for them.
uh, students take part and participate. I mean, because they, if they complain about the, the interaction, then it's... Yeah, you, you're right. You know, they complain, but then when you put them on the spot, they do not perform. And they come unprepared and they expect you to be prepared and when you, but uh, I think that the, in my opinion, the, the best correction are their own classmates. They, if they see that everybody is prepared and they are not prepared, then, so if everybody does this, then somehow there, there is the momentum that kind of gets everybody on the same page. Uh, it, the same is true about the complaints. Uh, it's an infectious disease. If three or four start complaining, then after three days, there are 50 of them complaining, then uh, with computers, it, it is a multiplicative uh, effect. And sometimes you just have to say, that's it. I, I, I have come to the end. I have no answers to your uh, problems and all this. If you want to take it up with the dean or whatever, course director. So, but uh, uh, everything has its positive and negative. So I like interacting with the students, but then sometimes you lose control and there is no end. They are like children. They want you completely, you know, mom, don't go away, I want you at home. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I would like to know uh, what is the, your secret uh, to, uh, to keep the students motivated in college? And how many of your students go through to be a pathologist in the field? Well, uh, I, I can motivate them uh, after after the second year. They, there is a relatively large number who say they will consider pathology after two e or two more years of clinical. That number is reduced, but we, we are still one of the schools that produces more pathologists. And so the investment of time and the, the, uh, my involvement and my colleagues pays off. Uh, I like to say that uh, there are two types of students that I like who have interest in pathologists. Those who will become pathologists and those who will become clinicians, but will appreciate what pathology has to offer. And that is the group that we specially kind of nurture. We, we have special awards for this type of students. We have a pathology student interest group that means uh, we delegate to them presentation of cases at clinical pathological conferences. We, we try to invite them to our departmental little... God is on our side. Yeah, but again, you know, I, as I said, uh, I I start my lectures saying to medical students, I, I, I love pathology. If I could transmit to you 50% of my enthusiasm for pathology, hurrah, I have accomplished my goal. I usually don't. <laughs> Professor, uh, you told us that uh, the students rely more in internet contents than in books. How, how you hold this book? Because uh, internet is not everything true. Yeah, unfortunately, that, that, that is uh, a battle that 
all, all the medical schools are fighting. First, I could give you one example. We, uh, we have the recommended, we don't have any required reading anymore. We have recommended reading. And uh, they are told that if they are going to challenge a question, we are not going to accept the Wikipedia or any other source. You know, they would put a link in there. I have read this and this, and this is this. And I said, I'm sorry. If you want to refer to Robbins on this page, and we are going to discuss it. But one of the rules that we set at the beginning is that we are not going to accept Wikipedia. They go back to Wikipedia, of course. Uh, at least we discourage them to accept it as the Holy Bible, <laughs> to develop a critical approach and realize that there are more than one answer. So, uh, how to get medical students to read? I, I don't know. They, we have 170 students, 70 of them, the statistics that we keep, 70 of them by Robbins. So less than half. Uh, we ask at the end of the course, how many of you have, after two years, how many of you have read 80% of Robbins or more? And for the last six years, it's always the same results between 14 and 16, 17%. So they don't read. And you know, they pass the national exams, they pass our exams. So they, something that I'm so, I don't know. I, don't get me into my negativistic approach. <laughs> I would love them to read, but they don't. I don't think that the reading uh, doctors are the doctors of the future. In Romania, we will not do this. That passes uh, uh, no English. It's not a surprise that uh, all the students that uh, I don't know English I, always I, pass. You know, I, pass. I, I would almost collect Ten Brazilian students who are, uh, or ten pathologists who do not speak English, and get them on the exam, they would pass. Uh, I know. Because they know to shoot. Uh, De certa maneira, a gente tem que buscar um novo sentido, construir um novo sentido para o governo ensinar. Né? No sentido de que o professor deve atuar cada vez mais como mediador dessa, dessa aprendizagem, e não ensinar uh, no sentido tradicional que nós uh, vinhamos adotando. É interessante notar que, o, o, como o professor mencionou, os estudantes reconhecem professores que se interessam de uma maneira autêntica pelo ensino. Né? E, e talvez a questão do conteúdo, é, acaba ganhando cada vez menos peso se a gente considerar esse novo perfil que, que o estudante demonstrando que uh, se torna mais efetivo na relação de ensino aprendizagem. É, de uma maneira geral, ficou colocado nessa, nessa apresentação que a patologia direta ou indiretamente ainda é uma parte muito substancial e significativa do curso de medicina e se a gente considerar o, o, os cursos da saúde, ela também é um substrato bastante relevante. Um dos pontos que acredito que foram bastante importante é algo que a gente traz de melhor da cultura americana para nossa, que ainda é um pouco resistente a isso, é que o uso de indicadores podem ser bastante úteis né? e a gente deve explorá-los para é, em diversos cenários é, e o professor colocou como isso é, é utilizado na sua instituição, como por exemplo o uso de portfólios, é, a avaliação não só da, das, do, das notas obtidas nos exames e, e e aquela avaliação subjetiva também que os professores conseguem efetuar aluno a aluno para identificar outros parâmetros para além da questão cognitiva 
durante, a, durante o curso de, do, do curso de graduação. A, a, a respeito desse, desse ponto, eu acho importante salientar que foi colocado que a avaliação do desempenho decente, ele de certa maneira guia todo o currículo. Então, não, não adianta nós termos boas estratégias do ensino ao longo do tempo se a gente passa a mensagem errada a hora que vai efetuar a avaliação ou se utiliza de, de uma maneira apropriada de avaliar, porque os estudantes se reconhecem como isso tendo, sendo o mais importante. E, e ah, importante também que a referência em avaliações externas, ela, ela é útil, mas ela tem as suas limitações. Então, as referências externas, elas devem ser consideradas. É, a adesão dos Estados Unidos é praticamente compulsória para vários desses exames. No Brasil, a gente começa a ter essa, essa, essa prática mas é, não, não se basear unicamente nesses valores e interpretá-los de uma maneira é, crítica é importante para que a gente consiga construir um, um currículo frente às necessidades é, que a escola está buscando atender. Bom, então nós vamos fazer um intervalo agora. Eu gostaria de dizer que ele disse isso em few words much better than I did in one and a half hour. Thank you very much. Thank you. Obrigado a todos.